also we are recording this session so after you jump off the webinar if you want to share what you've seen today with your friends just go on YouTube and search for build a hyperconverged infrastructure with disaster recovery in one go with Starwind and Veeam or just go to our YouTube channel and watch the most recent videos. We will also send a link to the recording in the follow-up email after the webinar. So now, our agenda for today's event. First, we're going to quickly talk through the importance of a good backup plan and why it becomes more and more important in today's IT in infrastructure. Then we'll go through the building blocks for your IT infrastructure and their main roles, their importance and where to use each block and what will be the best practices for using them. Then we'll go through the business continuity and disaster recovery we have built into the appliances and uh, then Michael will tell you about at least 57 restore scenarios. I'm kidding, it will be less than that, but Veeam has at least 57 restore scenarios for your virtual machines and applications. Then we'll see the 3 to 1 zero rule in action, which brings something new to the traditional 3 to 1 rule of IT infrastructure architect. And uh, then we'll talk a bit about new features in Veeam's availability suite. At the end we'll have a short questions and answers session and we'll gladly answer all your questions. So Michael, tell me why is it so important to have uh, a good and robust DR scenarios in place in today's IT environment? Yeah, thanks, Max. So with the you know introduction of what we consider to be the modern data center, right? So you're building out with servers, you're building out with virtualization, you're extending these platforms. We've noticed that through some some surveys and things like that, through, through the CIOs, that they realize that they can't deliver what they expect as far as you know the availability of their applications. And so that's where we introduce the term availability gap. And this is just where you have some sort of downtime. Maybe it's a couple hours. Maybe it's even a couple of days. And that's just kind of the cost of doing business. And that's not really going to work when these applications are, are so high in demand. They need users accessing them every single day. They need people going out there and being able to retrieve their data as necessary. So that's where we kind of fit into this. We realized that we could actually help a lot of customers with this availability gap um, and our availability software with backup, retention policies, being able to store it both locally as well as off-site, and really being able to offer what we consider an RTPO of less than 15 minutes. So no matter if we're talking about SQL data, exchange data, anything like that, that's where we can go out there and help you protect that, make sure you can not only back it up and protect it, but also recover it in less than 15 minutes. And because of this uh, software being able to help customers with this RTPO, that's what's really helped with Veeam's growth, that and word of mouth from customer to customer. So if you haven't heard of Veeam, it's probably something that's been put on your radar through one of your friends in IT or something along those lines. And we've seen a lot of customers coming over, over 4,000 customers every month are making the switch on over to using Veeam, along with a platform like Starwind for a SaaS recovery plan. As we talk about kind of what the, what the stats are as far as uh, downtime and what this is actually costing companies. Most companies have around 15 unplanned downtime events a year. It's definitely trending upward, maybe not a whole lot, maybe not very quickly, but we're headed in that direction where it's more and more common to have uh, some sort of outage, some sort of downtime. And, and you know, as, as we keep talking about these workloads, they're more and more critical, right? We're getting that gap where it's nearly 50%. Um, and that's really kind of where we start to hit that tipping scale. Now we see businesses being 24-7. There's no more real 8-5 to five businesses anymore. They need web servers, exchange servers. People need that always-on type of mentality. And if you even consider the, the cost of, of downtime, each of those 15 unplanned outages generally costs about $80,000. That's a pretty hefty price tag when you're talking 15 of those a year, basically almost a million dollars out there that people could be uh, getting back. Right, Max. So, so as far as being able to make this plan and be able to make sure that you have the, the proper software and uh, hardware out there to bridge this gap, Max is going to kind of kick things off with kind of talking about the Starwind software and how that can work as a backup target and how you can protect your, your virtual machines by backing them up to that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because yeah. uh, 
Technically, Starwind uh, right now is a one-stop shop for the entire virtualization environment because we originally started with Starwind's hyper-converged appliance, which unifies compute, networking, and storage within one server enclosure and allows you to dramatically simplify your virtualization environment from lots of different and proprietary equipment into two industry standard servers which can then scale out or scale up as you need thereby becoming a really easy solution for SMBs and even bigger businesses to make their IT environment agile and simple uh, but then we realized that one size doesn't fit all and uh, to build a robust and uh, highly flexible environment you cannot use the same building block even if that same building block comes in different sizes. So we came up with the storage appliance for those environments where you have the requirement to have high performance and high availability for a set amount of storage specifically designed for databases and data analytics delivering highest possible performance across the entire storage capacity and this became the second option after the hyperconverged appliance to expand just storage and don't go with just expanding compute and storage where you could expand it much more efficiently and of course all this is good but this is primary data this is low capacity high performance storage so to accompany it and to accomplish the 3210 rule we added the backup appliance and the backup appliance is really the high capacity beast of this offering allowing customers to seamlessly back up all their virtual machines, all their applications without resorting to a third-party solution. Effectively getting all components from one company, getting support from one company and being able to set up their environment really easy and manage it with minimum effort. And uh, we are really focusing on the backup appliance within this event because uh, we're going to go through how we can restore easily, how we set up the backups properly, and what are the most recent features in the backup included with the backup appliance. Because as a hardware, it is just a high-capacity storage tailored for backup also offering virtual tape library functionality but most of the functionality comes from the software we install on it making it the backup appliance for your infrastructure so as I mentioned getting professional and fast support for the entire appliance is critical and in a virtualization environment where your application density is as high as 100 servers per physical host is critical. So with our backup appliance, we do include a 24-7 one-hour SLA support for all the components. So customers who built their hyper-converged environment on Starwind, be it Starwind Virtual Sand or be it Starwind Storage Appliance or hyper-converged appliance, if they add Starwind's backup appliance, they effectively get support for their entire stack and they get engineers help within one hour should something bad happen. And not to make that happen, we offer lots of great features. Some of them relate directly to our availability and our resiliency and some of them allow us to restore easily. So for the backup appliance, we do have the industry standard deduplication. Uh, with the hyperconverged appliance, there is inline dedupe for the production data. With uh, the backup appliance, we do offer standard offline deduplication, not to overuse the hardware resources of the system. Then another feature which is peculiar to Starwind is cloud storage tiering. While 
Most of the solutions only have local capacity. Starwind can seamlessly add a cloud storage tier to any of the appliances. So if you have your backup appliance and you have, let's say, 10 terabyte of free space, you can easily expand that space with cloud storage and then backup appliance will decide whether old backups need to stay on the local storage or they can be tiered off to the cloud storage. And uh, if we're talking about restores, data stored in the cloud when it needs to be restored is pulled back to the local storage to a flash layer and you can then instantly restore your virtual machines and applications from that local flash layer. But overall you get an appliance which can scale to petabytes without noticing those petabytes converted to disks in your budgets and in your data center, consuming less power and being more reliable at the end of the day. Also, the appliance can scale up the local capacity if necessary. Let's say there is a mandatory requirement to keep this amount of data locally. You cannot send it to the cloud. You cannot offload it to tape or move anywhere. In this case, we just add more drives, add more enclosures to the backup appliance, and it treats it as a single storage pool. Now, on the other hand, if we talk about expanding into the cloud, we start enjoying a thing called cloud storage economics where if you add local storage you would pay for one JBOD and some of the drives in the JBOD or maybe a fully populated JBOD. In case of cloud backup you only pay for the gigabytes you're actually using and you're never paying for the free space. So if original plan was to buy three huge disk enclosures and fill those disk enclosures within three years that means that for the most time most space was just sitting there doing nothing and consuming your power and eating your budgets. With cloud that doesn't happen. You only pay for the capacity you're really using. Now with the virtual tape as I mentioned before uh, users can accomplish two things. There is uh, one which is boosting your backups because at certain point in time when there is just too much data to backup with a traditional tape library, you need to switch from tape to disks. In this case, you shorten the backup window, you make sure that all data gets backed up and the backup process doesn't affect the performance next day when people come back to the office. And even more, in 24-7 environments, you really need to do backups fast because it affects a 24-7 environment now. Another thing you can do then is implement a D to D to T backup strategy, which is disk to disk to tape. So you eliminate the tape as a performance bottleneck, but you leave the tape at the end to still have the capacity and still be able to offload the data to tapes for regulatory reasons, for keeping it locally, for sending it off-site, simply because you still have a tape, it's still a valid tool for backup. Now with cloud and DR site replication, there is an option to not only tier to the cloud, but also to replicate to a disaster recovery location or replicate the entire site to the cloud. So in case of a major outage, you can restore your virtual machines and applications into the cloud or use a disaster recovery location to spin up your production environment there where you have power and where you have the reserve data center. But uh, these are just plain features and uh, now we'll get into more details about how you can actually restore an environment and what are the new features coming from Beam Availability Suite embedded in the Starwind's backup appliance. And with that I'll give the floor to Michael. Thanks Max. So just a little bit on how Beam does our backup to kind of catch everyone up to speed. 
so you may have used other backup software in the past and kind of you'll have to throw a little bit of that mentality 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 out the window there we go and just because of the way that we handle our backup process beam is kind of built from the ground up for virtualization that really affects it in two different ways the first is that it's going to mean that we're a completely agentless backup process. There's no nothing that you need to install in the guest VMs. There's nothing that you're going to need to put out there inside of the, the machines like SQL or Exchange or anything like that to properly back those up. Now, the other half of this is, is how we're going to get these image level backups. Everything we do is going to be based around a snapshot. So whether we're talking VMware or Hyper-V inside of your environment, the Starwinds appliance is going to work with both of those. Um, so with this, we'll take snapshots or Hyper-V, they're sometimes called checkpoints. That's just a way to be able to take it, like a picture, a point in time of what that virtual machine looks like, and then from there be able to grab the blocks that are composed of that virtual machine, be able to write those off to some sort of disk. We do have to write to a disk as our primary target, so you would have to write to something like the Star Wars Appliance, you'd have to write to, to another disk, and then from there you can do like the tape archival or, or you can use them to go to the cloud. Those become your secondary options, your off-site options at that point. We can use VMware stand snapshots, so we have a feature called backup from storage snapshots. This is strictly for VMware, um, and it's going to be limited to a few specific stand vendors, so we're talking EMC, NetApp, HP, and Nimble at this time, with a couple other ones kind of in the works. So with Hyper-V, it's going to change it around. They use their VSS writers to, to back this up, um, so it does change the process just a tiny bit. With all this, we are able to properly quiesce in the applications. Um, so even things like SQL, Exchange, Active Directory, we can still go out there and back those up through the use of Microsoft's VSS writers. So these are tools that they built so that they can use their volume shadow copy services to get proper transactional copies of these virtual machines. So making sure we get nice, clean, consistent, transaction-based copies through that quiescence is really important to be able to not only back up those machines, but making it easier to restore those machines as well. And so as we take a look at some of the restore options that are, are out there, we have over 57. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, I won't make anyone have to listen to every single one of them. But I do want to go through a few of these, and, and we'll talk about a few of the highlights that are out there. The first one, and probably one of our most popular, is going to be for instant VM recovery. So instant VM recovery tells a great story of when a virtual machine goes down, something's happened, you need to get that virtual machine back up online. This is a great way for us to go out there and get that back in just a couple seconds. This does require that the backup be on disk, so not cloud or not uh, to tape or anything like that. It does seem to be your local disk. But what we're using is a feature we call vPower. Probably doesn't mean a whole lot just by the name, but essentially what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to be able to take that backup file on the repository where it's compressed, it's YouTube, it's in a backup format. We can actually present that image right back up to the um, um, up there to that server that we have, whether it be a Hyper-V host, VMware host, they see the image of the virtual machine, they see the VHT files, they see everything that they may need, and from there they can, it will power on that virtual machine directly. We'll run it from the backup file, so we're going to keep the backup file in a read-only format. Um, that way we're not changing anything to the server or anything along those lines. It's going to make it very simple, very easy to get back up there. Now, as we talk about, you know, kind of what would happen as the next step, you've got this virtual machine, it's almost functioning as a spare tire, so we're going to go up there and be able to run, but we need to get back to our original location eventually. That's why we, where we can use some tools to migrate the virtual machine, whether this be Hyper-V using their migration tools, VMware using something like Storage vMotion, or using Veeam's quick migration tools. We need to get it back to its production storage, where you can expect its full IOPS or, or full performance levels there. The reason that this is so important is that you can't really run virtual machines off that backup repository forever. It's not going to have the same processing, compute, things like that running off a backup repository. So that's where we need to take it and push it back to its production location, kind of get it back to where it needs to be. However, you can wait until it's a convenient time. So maybe it's going to be, you know, when everyone leaves the office at 6 o'clock. Maybe uh, you have some planned downtime at midnight. Maybe there's just a more convenient time, and that's where you can go out there and you can start that migration process. Another really key feature is the ability to verify the protection. So obviously when you take your backups, that's all great. A lot of software can do backups. But being able to verify that is kind of the next step. We have your general CRC integrity checks. Those are built into the software to happen as part of the job. But this verify protection we're talking about is something different called sure backup. Now you can see that it, it takes these virtual machines and spins them up inside of the cloud at representation here. That's actually just a fenced off environment. So it's actually going to be something more like a, a VLAN. It's completely separate from the rest of your environment where we can boot up these virtual machines, power them on, and then we're going to run a couple tests against them. We're going to verify that the operating system booted up fine. From there we can go out there and um, 
double check things like network connectivity, heartbeat tests, and then we can also run some scripting depending on the application as well. So this way you have a full way to test your, your backup files and you don't need to have an additional S environment or dev environment or anything like that. The way that this is working is using that same vPower technology, so it's actually using the backup files on your repository to be able to present it back to this uh, environment, the host that you selected, but have it completely segmented off so that it can't affect production, even if you're putting up a really critical machine. This concept also applies into our on-demand sandbox, so you can actually leave these machines powered up inside of this fenced off environment, and once they're up there, you can remote into them, you can get there via the console, that's where you can go out and do some of your own testing, maybe new Windows patches, maybe that's going to be the fact that you want to go out there and test out a new application, whatever it may be, you can leave things like AD powered on inside of that uh, application and uh, be able to test some, do some more testing inside of that. So this is kind of going into a little bit more detail about that, where we have these virtual switches basically that are acting as the, the, the proxies in between the two networks. All right, so we're able to kind of have the virtual lab sit in between those two sides so they can talk to machines that are on the virtual lab network, but they can also talk to the machines that are on your production network. The machines will actually boot up with the same IP address that they had inside of production. There's not going to be any IP conflicts, though, because the, the networks are segmented through that virtual lab proxy. Now, what's interesting is that it can do some masquerading IP. You'll see that down there in the bottom in red. This is where you can set an IP address when you go to set up the virtual lab, and this will allow you to then use that IP address to be able to get into the virtual machine inside of the virtual lab network. This way, if you have some users that maybe test applications or maybe they do some uh, other things inside of the network, this is where they can go out there and access the machine and do some of their own testing while it's actually spun up and kind of just sitting out there for them to play with. As far as some of the other things that we can restore, so a lot of people think that with image level backups there's going to be some discrepancies as far as being able to not restore files, not be able to restore things like application items, exchange, SQL, things like that. That's simply just not the case. We have a very clean, simple way to do these recoveries of mailbox items. So when you're looking for things like brick level recovery, you're looking for something like a, an individual contact, a calendar item, maybe something from their inbox, you can recover all those really granular pieces. So we have a couple different options as far as how we can recover these. And the Explorer that we're looking at is for 2010, 2013, and 2016. Uh, we have some other tools for some of the older versions if you guys are still on things like 2007. So what you'll see is, is kind of that's what our window looks like to write. It actually looks fairly similar to Windows Explorer, um, even though we're talking about exchange items. You'll see my EDB files listed as kind of my top piece up there. I'll see my mailboxes listed below those. And I'll see all the uh, kind of files and folders underneath that, the structures there. I'll be able to click on any of those, and I can do a couple search as well. You'll see over here in the search box, someone typed in Beam. So if they were looking for that information, they can go out there and see something about Beam. Maybe someone was talking about it. Maybe I need to keep that email and restore it back for them. We also have that Advanced Find Search button that you see up there, and that allows me to go out there and specify some, specify some very specific rules. So maybe I want to go out and I want to say something like I need to this range of dates needs to be from this sender to this sender. I'm looking for something for maybe like a legal process or a legal hold that might be out there. So it allows me to get very granular, set up a bunch of rules so I can see exactly what I was looking for, and then be able to find those exact items. That could be a search across just one person's inbox or the entire EDB as well. Now when it comes to doing the actual restore itself, there's quite a few different choices. The first cool thing that you can do is you can open up the email so that you can go out there and see what the contents of it are. You can see what's inside of this uh, in case you need to be able to verify it before it gets sent back. You can send it to a new person, so maybe you have to send this to the HR department or uh, you know someone up, uh, up the ranks has to approve this before it gets pushed back because it is for something like legal. You can go out there and send it to a, a different location as well. And also, obviously, putting it right back to its original location is going to be an option. This is all done without having to power on these types of applications, so Exchange never has to power on. We'll talk about a few other explorers in just a minute, what we can recover there. Never have to actually power those on. This is our just ability to go inside of a backup file, kind of dig inside of it, and be able to find exactly what we're looking for. So very simple one-click recovery is the key here. The next one to look at is Active Directory. These are all going to have a look that's very similar to each other, so I'm going to have that same type feel. Once you've used one of the Explorer tools, you kind of start to learn how the other ones are going to, going to be working. In this case, we're going to see our uh, domain up there at the top. We'll see users and computers below that. We'll see all my files and kind of folders kind of listed down past that. I'll see all my names of users or computers listed over to the right-hand side. And then I can right-click on those to do my restores. Now, with this, you can also do things like group policy restores. You can do DNS uh, record restores as well. And when you go to do something like a user-based restore, you right-click on the user, and you can either export it, import it back in later, 
or you can just put it right back to the original server as well. So right back into Active Directory without any other changes needing to take place. It restores the original password, so you don't even need to go out there and change their password form or force a password reset or anything like that. Very, very simple way for you to go out there, right click, be able to put that Active Directory object right back where it needs to go. This is going back into Active Directory 2003. As we take a look at maybe one or two other ones of these, there are kind of a limit on the number if we have these, but SQL is a really interesting one because of how granular we can get inside of it. This goes back to 2005 and up to 2016, and you can see that my structure is so that I can actually see the server name and see my database. So we've got a very simple SQL server here with just one database on it called the Backup Reporting. I would right-click on that to see my different restore options. My first option is to take the entire database and restore it back to its original production location. I can also take that same database and put it onto a different server. So we have a lot of customers making use of this. They're able to take this and kind of use this for test and dev purposes. Their DBAs can go out there. They can look inside of the SQL server. They can see what kind of um, information they want to do. They can play around with it, whatever they need to do, and they can just power off the dev server whenever they're done. Maybe they update that every single day or every week so that those SQL DBAs can go out there and kind of play with some things. With this, we can also do things that are a little bit more granular. So we can do table recovery, object recovery as well, getting down to things more like schemas um, as well as the system objects and, and just really granular pieces of that database. And then we can also go out there and we can do uh, transaction log replay or playback. This is where we can actually show you what the logs look like at a particular time that you select. And we'll give you all the transactions that were happening around that time. You can select the individual transaction. Then that's where you can go out there and have us restore back to that exact point in time. So it does make it a very simple process, even if you're not the most familiar with SQL as, and how it's kind of set up. You can even be able to go back to an individual point in time, whether that be a transaction, a minute, whether it be you know, a particular uh, table that needs to be restored. You get those types of options out there as well. Same type process, one-click restores as well to be able to go out there. And this is even available in Enterprise Manager. Um, so this and Exchange are going to be a two that are available through that. That's our web interface. If we did want to grant people granular access based on their AD credentials, you can actually go out there and have people log into a web interface, find the information that they need, they can right click and then even restore through that web interface without any access to the Veeam console. Like I said, down there in our last point, we have the ability to do transaction log backup that is also agentless, agentless as well. So this is where you can get the really low RPOs for something like a SQL server, say every 10 minutes backing up the logs or something that's a little bit more granular. All right, so hopefully we can advance this slide here. Looks like it caught up here. And that's just showing kind of how granular we could actually get there um, as far as being able to drill down into those individual transactions. Our newest one of these explorers is the Explorer for Oracle. So this is going to be somewhat similar to the SQL side of things, where we can go out there and see into these Oracle virtual machines, their databases, do those database level recoveries that you may need. We can also go out there and do the transaction log uh, backup as well as the transaction log replay as well. So same type features, not quite as granular down to, to some of the more uh, smaller pieces of those databases, but it is going to be that same type log type backup as well as transaction log replay, and then your database recovery will be out there as well. All right, Max, can you advance the slide for me? I'm having a little trouble there. So this is just talking about the 3-2-1 rule. Kind of, a lot of people are probably familiar with this. They already know kind of how this works. The 3-2-1 rule is just making sure that you have the proper amount of data to, to go through any sort of bad scenario, disaster recovery that might actually happen. So in the case of, a, of the 3 two, one rule, we want to make sure that you have three copies of your data. So your first copy is going to be your copy inside of production, what's actually running on probably your SAN, where your production virtual machines are living. From there, you're going to want to back it up to a secondary location, so some sort of disk on site, using something like Beam and, and Starwinds com combined. And then from there, you're going to want a copy into a third location. That could be something like the virtual tape library. That could just be another disk that you've got at the co-location. Well, this could be something off-site as well. So it really can be a whole bunch of different options on how you want to achieve these three copies of data. The two is for the separate media types. You want to make sure that you have at least a couple different media types, whether that be between you know uh, cloud as well as a, a disk-based solution, just so you can make sure that you have enough protection in case one type of media were to go down for some reason. 
and one for off-site, just making sure that you have at least one of these copies at a co-location, making sure that there's some way that in case you know a uh, fire broke out, you could be able to recover this data, whether that be recovering inside of the cloud, recovering to a, a co-location or something like that, host that you have at a different data center, really just kind of giving you a lot of flexibility as far as how you want to recover these objects. And then zero is something we actually added on recently, and this is for errors. So being able to test your backup files is really important. We talked about the sure backup process earlier, and how, just how critical that is. Being able to go out there and know, know that your backups are going to be good, know that you can use them in case of a downtime scenario, kind of having that audit trail, that extra check out there, just to make sure that everything's ready in case you were to need to do some sort of recovery. So a couple new products maybe that uh, people are not familiar with from the Veeam portfolio. Just at the end of 2016, we released Veeam back off from Backup for Microsoft Office 365. So this is a really simple tool that we release. It's a separate product from our backup and replication. But it's going to go out there and help protect some of the mailboxes that you might be migrating into Office 365. So with this, you add in your organization. So we're going to ask you for things like username, password, info about your organization to add it in. And then from there, you're going to choose information as far as where you want to back it up to. It can be backed up to any sort of drive. So this could be, again, like a Starwind thing. You could even run this virtual machine completely inside of Azure if you wanted to. What we'll then do is we'll take and back up based on a scheduled basis that you set up all those mailboxes into that particular backup repository. So similar to kind of how our backup was set up for a virtual machine, but we're now we're talking about an Office 365 organization. You can get granular with mailbox selection as well. So if you only want to select a couple mailboxes or all your mailboxes, you can kind of pick and choose. With this, you get the granular resource, just like our Explorer tool. It almost looks identical to it. In fact, it's basically using the same thing. People go out there, restore through these uh, particular mailboxes. You can search. You can do browses. There's lots of different options available for the Office 365 product. Another thing we released in our most recent version of the product, and this is version 9, is the ability to do a direct restore to Microsoft Azure. So some of your, your workloads are already up inside of Azure, so you'll have to use something like a Starwinds appliance or, or some other connection to be able to take your backup data and push it up there. This is where you can take any Windows, Linux-based virtual machine, whether it's VMware, whether it's Hyper-V, it doesn't make a difference. We're going to go out there and we're going to run the conversion here, and we're going to be able to go out there and be able to take this machine and power it on inside of Azure completely. So this is a really cool way to do either testing. You can actually have another location. This could be your DR site. Just so you can plan some some options out there to be able to have a, a second or third site in case something did happen locally. You have multiple different options when it's within inside of Azure. This does require the ability to go out there and have a subscription with Azure that needs to be set up before the restore needs to take place. But you don't get charged anything just by having the subscription. It's not until you start powering on these virtual machines that you actually start to get charged. So you can be very selective in what you actually power on. Maybe it's just the critical machines. Maybe there's a small workload of VMs that you would need to get back. But it's a cool way to be able to take your, your DR scenario and be able to push it up inside of the cloud and, and have everything running up at that particular location. We then released a couple of agent-based products, and these are separate, again, from backup and replication, which is our strictly virtual product. And these are going to be for backing up physical machines or possibly work uh, loads that you may have inside of the cloud. So maybe you're running a bunch of SQL databases inside of Azure. This is a great way to be able to protect those machines, as well as provide granularity for this. It is still going to be an image-based backup, so you can still back up the entire machine. You can do things like bare metal restore. You can even back up some of the, to the external drives as far as uh, NAS devices locally. This could be backing up to like a, an Azure box that you have out there with some storage attached to it. So there is a lot of good options as far as how you want to kind of set this up. It uses a lot of similar features to backup replication. The job setup looks pretty similar as well. It's even going to include things like the ability to set up guest processing. So things like SQL backup, Oracle backup, SharePoint Exchange. We can back up those physical systems using the VSS writer still, as well as getting those granular log backups too. With this, we release, it's not quite out yet, but it will be out very soon, and it's going to have the ability to instantly recover a virtual machine direct you know, to Hyper-V, or use that direct restore to Azure option as well. So if you had a physical workload that maybe a, a crash, you don't have any other physical hardware to put it on, you can't do a bare metal restore, that's what you can take and you can either put it inside of your Hyper-V environment, or you can go out there and take it and put it inside of Microsoft Azure as well. There is going to be two separate additions to this. So there's going to be a workstation edition and a server edition, as well as our free edition. We have free editions of all of our products that are out there. The workstation edition is going to include your remote configuration and management, so you can do all that via our APIs. 
It's also going to be, include protection for users outside of the corporate network. So this could be uh, the ability to kind of cache data locally. And as soon as they connect to the network, we'll start transferring all that cache up there as well. So they can still keep local backup points and be able to push those up inside of a cloud or push them over to your data center or something along those lines. It'll give you your technical support as well as the ability to write to a Cloud Connect. So if you are running to like a cl one of our cloud providers, that's where you can use the Cloud Connect software to write directly to them. And the server edition, um, on top of that, is going to be able to have the application where processing that won't be available in the workstation or free editions. So that's going to be a server-only uh, type of uh, application with the ability to transaction log playback and SQL log backup and a few of those more granular type uh, things when it comes to those applications. The other agent we released um, end of last year, this one is out already. This is the agent for Linux. It's a very simple GUI uh, based all on the command prompt, right? So you're going to be using some arrow keys and some, some commands based on that. It's very simple to install. It's also in just a couple minutes, but it's a great way to protect those physical Linux or cloud Linux workloads that you might have. Same type of philosophy here, image-based backup. You can back up to multiple different targets. You can back up to repositories. You can back up to the Starwinds appliance in your environment. So really any sort of location that you want to back up to is it, going to work with us. And then from there, you'll be able to do things like file level recovery. You can do the ability to do volume recoveries, full bare metal recoveries. So lots of great choices. The difference here in the, the additions is going to be that the workstation will give you your support, but then when you go up to the server edition, that's where you can add in some scripting. So if you have things like uh, specific data, databases like MySQL or something like that, that's where you can do some pre-freeze and post-all scripting so we can go out there and be able to properly back up those machines that don't necessarily have things like VSS writers. All right, so I know that was a lot of information to pack into a, to a short out of, amount of time. So with that, I kind of want to open up the floor for some questions for both Max and myself. If you guys have any questions, feel free to type those into the questions box as part of the GoToWebinar console. We'll get to interact with you guys and answer any, any questions that you might have. I know Max has been looking at the questions here um, uh, pretty, pretty closely over the past uh, 20 minutes while I was talking. Max, any questions out there? Uh, sure. Yeah, there, there are some questions coming in. Uh, okay, so for, first question coming in is saying, okay, that's Veeam, why Starwind? Uh, the most simple answer would be because within the Starwind appliance, customers who purchase uh, either our software or one of the appliances get unified support for both products. So typically when you're building your own hyperconverged stack or you're building your own disaggregated stack, you need to run different support contracts and uh, talk to different companies when you are in trouble. With Starwind hyperconverged appliance, first of all, we do the integration. Second, we provide the cloud tiering, and uh, lastly, we provide unified support and never say that, oh no, that's that's probably some, something like a Veeam issue, please contact Veeam guys. We don't, we don't do that, we, we simply make sure that customer is happy and his environment is running 24-7, or if a disaster strikes, we'll, there to, we'll be there to help. Okay. Looks like a couple of questions just uh, from, from for Veeam's perspective. Someone did ask when that Windows agent is coming out. That should be coming out in Q1, so we're looking at about the next month, month and a half. Uh, we should have that product out. Good. And another question coming about Stalman. What sort of redundancy and self-healing properties does the backup appliance have? Raid level, predictive failure reporting, etc. So uh, the basic appliance does use RAID 50, and then RAIDs can be substituted with uh, included a RAID recording. So the hybrid appliance, which has the flash restore layer, will simply use flash as a tier, and then a portion of flash used as cache. So when you pull up some data, it instantly gets cached into the flash layer and uh, pinpointed there while it's being used. Then for predictive failure reporting, we use the embedded uh, iDRAC functionality in the appliance. And uh, also, we will be showing uh, technical demonstrations of the product, and I think there will be a recording of one on our website really soon. OK. 
Okay. Let's see. Looks like we had another question come in asking about demos. So I know from the Veeam side of things, we have demos on our website that are just reported. We also have live demos with an engineer every single day. Or you can reach out to us, and we can gladly schedule a demo um, from our perspective. I'm sure Max can add on, on their demos and how that works. Yeah, so we're also planning on having pre-recorded demos, but as of right now, when you go to the Starwind website and go to the backup appliance page, you can basically ask for a demo, and our engineers will reach out to you and schedule a demo of the appliance. Okay, there is one more Veeam question. I'm new to Veeam and will be implementing here in the next couple of weeks. What would you recommend I take a look at? So we actually have a best practices and deployment guide that's really useful for kind of setting Veeam up for the first time. We also have, like I said, a YouTube channel and everything like that if you're, you're more video centric when it comes to being able to watch something. That user guide is, is great. It goes through every single thing, kind of what every option is. The product is pretty easy to set up. Um, it generally doesn't require my customers to ask too many questions, but if you do have questions, that's where it's good to have a salesperson um, that you know that can reach out to our engineering teams as well, and they can just make sure we can line up a call if there's any questions that you have outside of that. Okay, and I think that's all for today's questions. I don't see any new questions coming in. Michael? No, I don't see any other questions at this time. Good. So in this case, I would like to thank everyone for attending our today's event. Feel free to reach out to Starwind and Veeam to get more information. And uh, we'll be following up with an email with the invite, sorry, with the recording of this event. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.